everyone. Um, thank you so much for having me. I'm really honored to guide this very important conversation today. And I'll start by introducing my panelists. Um, Aaron Giger Smith is a writer and editor at Brennan Center for Justice and its new initiative, State Court Report. She is the author of the book, Thank You for Voting, and its companion, Young Readers Edition. She's a journalist who has written for many publications, including the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, and Reuters. Also joining me today is Shaniqua McClendon. Shaniqua has worked in politics for more than a decade and is currently the Vice President of Political Strategy at Crooked Media, home to the popular podcast Pod Save America. In this role, Shaniqua leads the creation of their voter and volunteer engagement program, Vote Save America, that's raised more than $55 million for progressive candidates and causes. Prior to Crooked, Shaniqua began her career as a White House intern for President Barack Obama, and then went on to Capitol Hill, where she served as a policy advisor and a legislative director, where she spearheaded the creation of the very first congressional bipartisan HBCU caucus. So Shaniqua and Aaron, welcome. So we promise that today's conversation will not be all doom and gloom, um, but we do know, you know, we're all here to um, learn tips to help us navigate this era in which misinformation is running rampant and is having a lot of implications for American life. Um, but I do think it's important that we start by grounding ourselves in the problem and what we're facing right now. Um, NBC News reported that mis- and disinformation is posing an unprecedented threat this year. Um, and that the country is not well prepared for it. Claims about election fraud have really shaken people's faith in democracy. Um, there's emerging technology, AI specifically, that is making it easier to spread lies at warp speed. Um, big social media platforms are pulling back on the safety nets that they have put in place to keep a check on political misinformation. And that says nothing of the foreign influences with interest in destabilizing our democracy. Um, so not a lot at all, right? Um, but you know, there, it's, it's such a huge problem, and I, and I want to start by asking you all, what, what part of this mess is keeping you up at night? All of it. Um, but it's both the vastness of it and how mainstream it is. So I think in times in the past, we thought if we read the news and keep up with things, we're maybe immune from it, but it's not. We, any of us can fall victim to it or not be paying attention to the right thing. Um, and it can attack every part of elections. So for lack of a better word, tricking people about dates or where to vote or how to vote, but also the heart of election integrity, of sped, spreading um, voter fraud, disinformation is not going to go away. Um, I think what most keeps me up at night is are we in the media going to do a good job of predicting what this election cycle's vote by mail is? Because I think we were caught a little off guard last time for a lot of reasons. Obviously, the pandemic pushed vote by mail into the forefront, but we weren't prepared for it to be such a target of disinformation. So I want to, I hope we do a better job of predicting that. I think we are with room for improvement. Um, but that's what makes me sleep a little better, is I think we're better primed this round and understand that predicting and preparing both ourselves and the public is a huge task, but we have to be doing it every day. Optimism, see? I told you. I'm going to try. I'm going to try to bring it back every time. Uh, Shaniqua, how about you? Yeah, uh, similarly, just about everything um, is keeping me up at night, but I think the specific things, uh, first and foremost, is the intentionality behind the spread of mis- and disinformation. Um, it's, you know, not as if people are, uh, well, some people, but mistakenly sharing stuff. There's a lot of intentionality here now, and purposely trying to disenfranchise people, and because our government moves a lot slower than technology, which is another uh, thing that is just making it a lot worse, these bad actors are able to just move a lot quicker in um, spreading misinformation. And it's, you know, before a lot of people even realize what's going on. Um, you think about the digital divide. I grew up in a very rural part of North Carolina. We got a computer when I was in high school, but it didn't have internet. So, you know, you think about the gaps um, in just technology literacy that people have, and you pair that with um, 
with me media literacy, which is not something that our country has ever been, you know, super great at. Um, and it just creates a perfect storm for people to get information that they might think is true. Um, when people think about the internet, they think about something that's accurate. It's technology, it must be right, but it's, be, it's a tool now that's being used um, to, to, you know, trick people. I hate to say that. Um, and, you know, the reason I hate to say trick is another part of this. People want to feel smart. People don't like when they are being made out to feel dumb and the thought that you could be, you know, tricked by some kind of conspiracy theory or information that's put out that's not true, people are resistant to being told that they're wrong or they don't know what they're talking about, um, which is, you know, with, with stubborn people, um, it's hard to, to get through to them. Um, and then finally, there's always some kind of kernel of truth um, that people leverage when they're spreading mis and disinformation. Uh, I think back to, I, I think it was 2018, there was a, a race in Alabama or Arkansas, and there was a Democrat who people seemed to think might have a real opportunity at winning. I think it was a House seat maybe. But they, the Republican campaign put out um, this ad, it was a radio ad, and it was two black women talking about a white woman accusing a young black man of rape. And the two women speaking were just so upset and like, how could she do that? You know, just really playing on a lot of this country's history, a lot of distrust um, within the black community. And again, you know, we look at this country's history, there's some kernel of truth there, but it's being exploited um, to, to make people believe other things. And essentially that was so that black voters would not go out and support this uh, Democratic candidate. So, you know, all of those things kind of come together and just make all of this really hard. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you both touched on some really important points that we're gonna come back to. Um, but first I wanna talk a little bit about <clears throat> how things have changed, right? Um, so at Capital B, we recently reported on disinformation as the new literacy test, um, campaigns to lead to mislead black Americans and ultimately suppress their rights are not new. Um, after Reconstruction, we know that the South put forth measures um, like literacy tests made up of questions that were impossible to answer uh, to prevent black people from voting. And what we're seeing now is sort of a media literacy test, right? Like, can you discern between what's real and what's not on your Facebook feed? Um, can you tell if you're getting a robocall and whether or not that's misleading you? Um, and for us as black journalists serving black readers, it's been really important for us to uh, point to deceptive tactics and how they've morphed over time to, to suppress our rights. Um, and I'm curious from your point of view, um, where you sit and the work that you do, um, what is important to note about what's changed and what's different now? Well, I mean, I thought that that story made such a great point because that is what it is, is using new tactics to get to the same bad intent, which is to get people not to vote or prevent them from voting. But in a way, at the time of literacy tests, those were legal forms of discrimination. And then after voting rights were better protected, and especially after the Voting Rights Act, there were continued discrimination that was illegal in form, and there was a ways to fight it. The courts were the ways to fight both of those things and enforcement of the laws that we had. The issue now that is more difficult in a way to wrap your head around is that these things, many of them aren't necessarily illegal, especially if you're just spinning things that have a kernel of truth, as Shaniqua said. And so you can't always fight them in the courts. There's often not time to anyway. And so it really is having to face them head on, anticipate what's happening, um, and try to prevent it. I, one of the things that the Brennan Center is doing that I think is so interesting, and it's not something I'm working on personally, but I've enjoyed hearing about, is they're really working with election workers nationwide to hear what disinformation they're facing and kind of trying to crowdsource how to fight it. Mm. And so I think things like that are so important and the more people know about them, the more you can trust the system a little bit, but we have to be, we have to be so guarded. It's just, it's difficult. It's like mm -hmm. a, an amorphous problem yeah. that you have to fight every day. Yeah. But you're absolutely right that it is, it's just a new form 
of voter suppression. Mm -hmm. And you're right that you know recourse is hard. It's hard to figure yeah. out how to how to um, address it. Shaniqua, how about you? Yeah, um, I thought that article was was spot on. Um, you know, the tactics change, but as Aaron said, that the the hope and the outcome that people um, are aiming for is to suppress votes, and typically it is to suppress the the votes of uh, black and brown people. Uh, one thing, you know, that really stood out to me, and I'll touch on this more. I think technology is like a huge way that things have changed since, um, you know, uh, the early days of voter suppression. Uh, but that they were using actual like signs um, to convince people of different um, elections, and it it just seems so. I don't know, so obvious that they would do that, but um, you know, in 2024, you wouldn't think that people are using something as basic as signs to trick people, and I think because most people would not assume that a sign has misinformation on it, they're gonna trust it, because why would someone mass produce something <laughs> with incorrect information? Mm -hmm. uh, and then, how do, you, how do you fight that? You know, do you run around and pull the signs out of people's yards? No, because they're going to say, why are you in my yard pulling things out of it? And then again, to what I was saying before, how do you convince them that it's inaccurate? You know, how do you convince them that someone gave them this information and they weren't, you know, smart enough to catch that it wasn't real? And then, uh, you know, to what I was saying before, technology has really morphed uh, this problem and, and made it a lot harder to, to control. Mix that with a fractured media environment, and it's just, again, a perfect storm uh, for everything that is happening. You have people in siloed parts of our media system receiving really targeted messages, and then they're in an echo chamber, so they're just passing it around, and there's not kind of like an outside person or entity that they can bounce these things off of for them to say, hey, that's not actually right. You know, all the trusted sources are within the echo chamber. And so it's really hard to, to penetrate those things and get that information. It's not, you know, like decades ago where you had a few news stations that people all consume the same thing. Now people are consuming what they want to. It's being reinforced by the people in that echo chamber. And once you hear stuff enough and it validates what you're saying, you're going to keep believing those things. So it's just really um, hard, hard to penetrate. And the last thing I'll say about technology, you know, there's a generational divide. Uh, you know, my grandmother is older. Mm -hmm. And even thinking about the calls she gets asking for her credit card information or her bank information. And to her, these people on the phone sound like they're just concerned. They'll tell her there's some problem. And she's like, well, I got to fix the problem. And so when you think about someone who's older and maybe spends more time on Facebook than anyone should, and they're seeing their friends mm -hmm. post things and repost things, these are their trusted sources. And so there's probably like even a lesser degree of, again, digital literacy there. And you mix that with the lack of media literacy. And I know I've said perfect storm like 10 times, but it just literally is creating this environment where things are bound, bound to, to go wrong. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so we've talked about the problem. We've talked about uh, how it's changed. Erin, um, I'm going to kick it to you to tell us how to fix it. Great. Um, I know you hold right all the answers, but <laughs> truthfully, your work at the Burning Center, you do help to share media literacy skills. So I want you to just talk us through how people can build those skills for themselves and um, what you tell people in your everyday work. Sure. So when I write these down, they sound sort of basic but they are the practices that work re re whether you're looking at old media sources or new media sources or social media or YouTube, it's all the same. I think the first thing is to admit that media, media literacy and news literacy isn't innate. It's a learned skill and we all have to keep learning and navigating it. Um, but basic things still hold true. Number one, know where your information is coming from. Whatever you're looking at, ask yourself, is this a reputable source? That might mean a national newspaper. It might mean a newer organization like Capital B is or like the 19th is that report for a, a group of people, try to report from a, a specific perspective, but is still you know, an excellent source of news. It, but it also might be a substack run by a single reputable journalist, or it might be a YouTuber, as I said, but just ask yourself, 
who is this person? Go to their about tag, go to the organization's about tag, learn if they have journalistic ethics. Lots of times people will say what their processes are, look at that. Um, and try to ask yourself, where did this person get the information? Did they look at a lot of posts on social media and form an opinion, or were they in the room? For your real news, for your day-to-day -day facts, especially about elections, you really wanna try to get them from people who were there. And if you're looking at something, to the second point, if you're looking at something that feels inflammatory or controversial, or you question if it's true, Unfortunately, these days, you do have the responsibility for yourself to go fact check. I promise if something crazy happened in a race or a candidate did something wild, more than one person is going to have it. And more than one reputable person is going to have it. And, you know, the same is true. Even if, if the Washington Post breaks a huge story within, I mean, really minutes, but an hour, other news organizations are going to match it. So... If something sounds wild, take it in and check another place to see if you can find it. Um, and then just over the whole course of this election cycle, build up your own reliable, stable, diverse set of news sources and continue reading from the same organizations. It will really help you kind of develop a sense of how things are done, where things are going, and it'll help get your, um, you know, get your feelers up. And that stable of news should include a local news source. And this, my thing that I say anytime anyone gives me a microphone <laughs> is that state and local elections are every bit as important as the presidential election. And your local news sources are going to be who has that information and who knows the landscape. As I'm sure we'll discuss, no one can pretend local news hasn't suffered greatly and that we lack resources, but there are a lot of places that are putting together small nonprofit news organizations, even it's just three former journalists from the local newspaper. Most places have at least a few reliable people working, so find those people and support their work and that helps build up reliable sources too. Um, and though I love the news business more than anything, there are also export, expert organizations like where I am now at the Brennan Center and State Court Report um, that if a particular issue is stressing you out, find out an organization that really spends a lot of time studying that and calm yourself down by, by reading reports and informations and explainers. Um, could you guys do the next, next slide, please? Um, so these are a few of the things that my colleagues at the Brennan Center have done, and I personally just found them calming. So we have the Election and IRS playbook that runs through, I mean, I really, I, I'm so proud to be a part of this organization because I think this thing is amazing. It runs through all the potential ways people might try to, um, subvert the election or just disrupt things and who needs to be dealing with them, what you can expect. It's These researchers are just really helpful. Um, one thing that's not on here is just this week they published a huge years-long study on um, post-Shelby County, which is the Supreme Court decision in 2013 that gutted a section of the Voting Rights Act that describes what that has done to the racial turnout gap. And understanding stuff like that <clears throat> helps you know why voting rights advocates are fighting so hard in court and working so hard at get out the vote. Just the more you can understand the different issues about voting and elections, I truly think the calmer that you'll feel. Um, one more slide, that's it. Next slide. Um, is a, As you may have noticed, there's a lot happening in state courts these days. Um, and so another thing, a sort of new initiative is the state court report that really breaks down what's going on in individual state courts and how that might impact other courts. So if you see what happened in Alabama a few weeks ago at there, or just a week ago maybe, it's been a long week, um, the point of this site is very specific, but these issues are going to be really big in the election and um, 
the long, long story short, seeking out expert organizations that are dealing in specific issues can both help calm your nerves and inform you of what is a problem, what isn't a problem, and if it is a problem, who's dealing with it and how you can um, support them in that way. So that's my news literacy tips, and I assume I solved did I solve it? Are we done? You did. Thank yes. you. Um, excellent points, and particularly having rep, like diverse sets of reputable news organizations that you're following is, I think, especially critical and applicable. Um, Shaniqua, it's Super Tuesday. Um, it Texans, along with many other people across the country, are casting votes in primaries. Um, but things are a little different than they were in 2020, right? Uh, particularly with social media companies rolling back the policies that were meant to mitigate mis- and disinformation. Um, so how has the role of social media in shaping voters' opinions changed since the last election? And can you share any specifics on um, how people can, you know, analyze political news that they see coming in their feeds? Yeah. Um, you know, I was thinking it's so crazy. Like, when I started college, Facebook had just started, and it was just this fun place where you posted things on your wall that you were going to the dining hall and, and things like that. And now, you know, it's dramatically impacted our politics here. It's, you know, been the cause of race, you know, race and religious uh, uprisings in other countries and has just become so powerful and I think at the core of this, which is not just for social media platforms, but also the way that our media has shifted in general is money is just driving a lot of the decisions um, that we're seeing. I think about a platform like Twitter, which was my favorite platform um, and it's changed dramatically, but it was a place that I would always go to when I felt like uh, community or like mass events were happening that everyone wanted to collectively come together, hear what people were thinking, uh, see what people were saying about it. And as you know, our media environment has become more fractured, it was a place I felt like you could see what other people thought, even if they didn't agree with you, you could engage in dialogue in a way that might not always be so healthy, but was still interesting um, and just allowed you to see other people's points of view. And generally since 2020, all of that has changed. Um, you know, Twitter has been purchased by Elon Musk, who has his own set of beliefs and agenda with using the platform, the people who have been prioritized, um, you know, even blue check marks not meaning anything is a huge change from mm -hmm. 2020. When people go to Twitter, before when I went, if I saw a blue check mark, I felt good about what I was reading. I knew that that person had gone through some kind of process to ensure that they were who they say they are and they weren't purposely spreading mis and disinformation. Um, but now, you know, whenever I see something crazy on Twitter and a blue check mark, I'm like, yeah, they're probably mm -hmm. paying for that and they mm -hmm. <laughs> paid for it so that they could. Um, seem to have more credibility. But again, if you're not paying attention to the dialogue around Twitter, do you even know that that change has happened? Do you even know that people can purchase their verification? Uh, and then you see that Facebook and all of their, sorry, Meta and all of their entities have the same thing. Um, now, they didn't take those away from people who are verified, but they did give people the ability to, um, to purchase verification. Uh, I don't know why I'm sharing this story. This somebody I was going on a date with, he, I saw that he like did not have a blue check mark, and then he did like right before the date, and oh, I was just like, why? Why does he have this? You know, <laughs> um, and you know, it made me think some things. I don't know. That did maybe you, that's unfair. Did but, you go on a second date? Um, we hung out for a little while, but <laughs> I, ultimately my initial thoughts were correct. <laughs> um, but you know. You shouldn't be able to purchase that. You know, it doesn't matter if you think highly of yourself. You know, it should matter that, um, you know, there's a reason for you to have that verification. Um, and so, you know, Twitter has changed tremendously. I think something else that um, is really important to point out is not just what the platforms are doing, but what they're not doing. Mm -hmm. Recently, Facebook announced that they would not be promoting or suggesting political content. Um, and I, I truly do think that Mark Zuckerberg thinks, oh, if we just like take our hands off of this, we will, people can't blame us for things anymore. Um, I actually interned at Facebook while I was in graduate school in the summer of 2017. And 
really uh, illuminating experience. My second to last, or maybe it was my last uh, week there, that Saturday before that final week was when, um, you know, the rallies and Charlottesville happened. Mm. And when we got back to work on Monday, we always had the staff meeting and to see the product safety people bending over backwards to justify like why they left the events up on Facebook was quite disgusting to see. Um, and so, you know, I think back to then, I think back to Mark Zuckerberg saying, oh, we didn't have an impact on the 2016 election. And I think this recent decision is their attempt to wash their hands. The problem is, if they are not um, promoting that content, people still want to talk about and know about the election. And so now they're gonna get that information from people, probably with blue check marks, who don't know what they're talking about, and that's how they're gonna learn about the election. Um, and so by not doing anything, they're creating a vacuum and a void that needs to be filled, and it will be filled, and people will unfortunately get less accurate information. Um, and, they're still responsible, you know? The core, the core of this problem is they don't moderate content well. If they did that and they didn't promote um, political content, maybe we might be in a better situation, but they let things that get clicks and likes just kind of run rampant, and I don't think that's gonna change just because they've made this decision. I actually think that their inaction is gonna have an even greater negative impact on our election this year. Uh, but to your last question about what people can do. I think it's a lot of the same stuff that Aaron said. You have to look at the source and motives um, of the people who are providing this information. I know that in more modern culture, people love to hate on the mainstream media. Fine, but journalism is like a real practice that has standards. And um, as Aaron was saying, if a story comes out in the Washington Post, eventually if it's you know accurate and right, other news organizations will um, publish information as well, but they're not relying on the Washington Post process. They're running through their own process to make sure that it's accurate. And so I get people's frustrations, but I, I think it's important that even if it's not like the New York Times, even if it's a local newspaper, go to actual journalists, go to people who have a set of ethics, a set of standards and what they're putting out. Blogging is not the same. Um, I got a degree in journalism in college and I got 50 points off of an article because the quarterback, our, I went to UNC, our uh, newspaper was the Daily Tar Hill and uh, our quarterback at the time was Joe Daly and those were not spelled the same and I spelt his last name the way Daily, like the Daily Tar Heel is spelled and my professor took 50 points off and that like has stayed with me that even a spelling error is an error and it needs to be factual and so that's the way that journalists approach their work and just really going to people who, who take it seriously um, is, is really important. Yeah, I think that's a really important point um, and I think one potential solution is also just being more transparent about the process, right? Like, yeah. people don't know what journalists do. People don't know, you know, the sweat and the time and the hours. People don't know how journalists get access to documents. Mm -hmm. People don't know about the things that don't get published, the decisions that you make to not, you know, make something public. And so I think that's a really important yeah. um, part of the education is understanding what journalists um, actually do. Yeah. Um, I want to talk a bit about distrust. Um, Many communities, especially black communities, have, you know, some good historical reasons to be distrustful of traditional pipelines of um, news and information. Um, Capital B's model is built around slowly undoing that work over time. We have um, a community engagement practice um, in which we're constantly reaching out to residents, talking to them, being in dialogue with them, understanding what their need, information needs are, their curiosities, and those interactions fuel our reporting. It's not just our reporters, you know, um, following their own leads and scoops, right. but also yeah. community really sort of sourcing Absolutely. the work yeah. um, that we do. And the theory, what we're betting on is that, you know, over time this helps us to be more valuable to people. If we're yeah. literally delivering information that we know that you need, maybe you see us as credible, valuable, maybe even indispensable over time, you start to trust media, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but that's a long game, right? That is pounding the pavement, day after day, hoping for some impact in the long haul. Um, but I wanna know that, I wanna understand what you guys think about um, how to address these issues more urgently when you're dealing with communities who might have heightened levels of distrust. Right. 
Well, first, things like that are wonderful because the more you can have people covering communities that understand that community, it both means the stories are told better and it means the people might trust the story more. But on the other hand, especially if a community is undercovered, that community needs to be covered and I think reporters of all kinds need to be in communities of all kinds. But if you were, it, when I've gone into a community that I know I'm not a part of, I just know that I have to try to ask even more questions, be really open to answers. If someone is telling me I'm missing it, then I probably am. I mean, you have to have the ego check of like, all right, well, what am I missing? Am I bringing in some sort of bias that I don't know I have or that I didn't want to admit to myself I have? I mean, you really have to do that work. And then, I mean, number the long answer is we need Journalism has historically been a field of white males and then white females, and it just, it's so, so, even in my 15 years in the industry, it has changed so much, and that is so nice to see, but there's, it's just so, there's a lot more work to do. Um, so we are gonna have people covering communities of which they're not a part. Um, and it is really, it's just about listening and being humble and leaning on your colleagues that are part of that community. But even in, in some cases, there can be a new a benef some benefits. Like if you're starting a new beat, it's the best time to ask the questions because you know nothing. And so you can uncover stories that need to be told that people in that community may think are obvious, but they're not obvious to the larger world. And since part of reporting on a community is to help others understand that community, it can be a service. Um, but it sort of makes me think of when I am covering, and I spent several years covering youth voters, and I am not 19. I know that's gonna <laughs> be a surprise to everybody. And I don't have the same experiences that a 19 year old is having. And you just have to listen to what they are telling you is important and believe it. And that's really like the best you can do. I don't think there's any real formula, but it's just being as open as you can and asking as many questions as you can. Mm -hmm. And then building our rosters to be much more diverse than they have ever been. Mm -hmm. I do think it's improved and I think things like capital B are such a huge important step and I think there will be capital B types in lots of communities and I think that's going to be hugely important. I hope so. Yeah. Um, Shaniko, what are your thoughts? Yeah, no, I agree and I think the work that you all are doing is, is amazing. Um, it's making me think, uh, I think I was talking to like a political strategist in Florida who said a lot of the um, People living there, whether you know immigrants or like first generation from um, from Latin American countries, the news sources that they go to first are from their home countries, and that is where they get their news. And I think maybe Donald Trump or someone they were pitching stories to these foreign uh, newspapers because they knew that that's where people were getting their news. Mm -hmm. And so I say that to say the messengers are really important. Um, you know if you want to gain trust in a community, who is saying the thing matters. Even if, you know, you think about a political surrogacy program, Joe Biden saying something versus, I don't know, well, Beyonce doesn't do surrogacy work, but if she did, <laughs> you know, people, um, they, they would listen to her. And there's a certain level of cultural competency that just has to be there. Also, I don't think that communities of color, I mean, I know it, don't want someone coming in who feels like they're an outsider, kind of telling them this is what you should care about. And I think what Aaron just said about listening is also really important. If you are providing information that no one asks for, like they're probably not going to consume that and then start to question, like, why are you telling us this stuff? We know this, we wanna know about other things. And so getting community input in that um, is really important and, and not being condescending. Um, journalism, is an elite space. Like even if journalists don't make a ton of money, um, you know, you have people who have gone to elite institutions. They 
literally are processing information all the time, so there's probably just inherently they're gonna feel like they know more than others. But the way I see it is you know different information than others, not more. And so if we're working together um, to understand you know, what communities want, you can um, provide that. And we, we do need to diversify our newsrooms, and that's not just on, you know, it's good to have people of color around. There's just experiences that people have that inform the way you cover stuff, the way you write about stuff. And I think something that we saw um, in recent years with a lot of the racial um, responses to racial violence and police violence is, or even, um, you know, I think there, it was at the Washington Post where there was a rape victim who was a journalist and told she couldn't like report um, on uh, sexual, violence. sexual violence, yeah. Um, that's crazy. These things, our experiences inform how we talk about things, the way we talk about it. You know, she probably could interview a sexual assault survivor in a way that someone who has not experienced that wouldn't understand how to, to come into that conversation with care and concern and get the answers that they're looking for. Um, and, you know, a, a funny example is Kamala Harris becoming vice president and them talking about her being a part of Alpha Kappa Alpha sorority. And I remember the reporting about like the weird noises everyone was making. <laughs> like, you know, I'm not in a sorority, but like I am very familiar with, um, with black sororities and fraternities. And so it's just like, what does that, what are they talking about, you know? Um, so having, making sure that we have the right messengers um, I think is really important. Also because when we, if you don't use the right messengers for the good information, then the messengers that seem relevant will allow them, you know, they'll be allowed to kind of insert themselves. And I'm just going to, I don't care for this man. Charlemagne the God has like taken up so much space in the political discourse for black people. He's not a journalist. You know, they had Nikki Haley on their show. They didn't really press her on her stances. Um, but for some reason, politicians go to his show. He is brought on as some kind of political expert that speaks on behalf of black people. And that is not to discount the audience that he has, but that's actually the problem. He takes up a lot of space and people listen to him and he doesn't know what he's talking about. And so it's important that the kind of good actors fill that space before the bad ones do. Yes, definitely. Um, Let's talk a bit about local news. Um, you guys have all heard that local news is dying, but I want to talk a bit about its connection to civic engagement and to media literacy. Um, but first, some stats. Um, the US is losing newspapers at a rate of two per week. Mm -hmm. uh, since 2005, the country has lost more than one fourth of its newspapers. It's on track to lose a third by 2025. Uh, this has resulted in uh, what is known in our business as news deserts, um, areas without adequate local news coverage. And that is currently affecting around 70 million residents, which is about one fifth of the population, um, which is just it's wild, right? Um, and we know that when there's no local news, people turn to national news sources, um, and that can cause more polarization. Um, and we know that civic knowledge just suffers when there's no local news, right? When people don't know what's going on in their communities, they can't be civically engaged. Um, and civic engagement and, and media literacy go hand in hand. So, um, Shaniqua, why don't I start with you? Can you just talk a little bit about that and the importance of that and, and why that is an important part of this yeah, yeah. Specifically, when I think about civic engagement and and politics, when there's not local news, there's no one to specifically hold local leaders or even national um, national or people in federal positions accountable. Because you look at cable news; they are looking for entertainment at this point. Again, it's really money driven, and they need eyes. They need people paying attention. So you get a lot of okay, you're on this side of the issue, you're on this side, like argue with each other. But something one of my professors would say all the time when we talked about local news is you used to have at least one paper covering, um, you know, sorry, I'm messing up the math. But anyway, you had at least one paper covering your two senators. Um, but in a lot of places, you had multiple uh, local papers covering your senators and your um, members of the House. That's not happening now. And so the only way they're getting covered is if they do something crazy or controversial. Um, but it also, 
provides the space for them to just kind of like lie about whatever's going on. You know, if they voted for something and no one's paying attention, or for instance, there's a voice vote, um, there's just a lot that can happen where they don't have to answer for it because no one's telling the constituents, hey, your member of Congress did this, hey, your person in the state legislature did this. And it's interesting because it allows people, to, you know, people have a lot more proximity um, as you go down the ballot, the more um, local a candidate is, you have more like physical proximity to them. And so they, you know, we're starting to see a lot of national stuff just go further down the ballot uh, to stuff that like a city council member has nothing to do with, but that's who people have proximity mm -hmm. to. But the people who need to be I don't want to say yell that, but the people who need to be held to account, they just are in Washington with really no one paying attention to them. I mean, look at Mike Johnson. No one knew who he was before um, however many speaker conversations they had to have before they landed on him. And now all this stuff about him is coming out. I'm sure his constituents had no idea about most of that stuff, but they would have known that he did not think that the election should have been certified had there been some local reporters reporting on that, um, that just seems like a crazy thing to not know until he becomes uh, Speaker of the House. So it's really important. Also, there are local issues happening that are not being covered. Um, and when that happens, again, how can people be engaged? Civic engagement isn't just voting. It's about understanding what's going on in your community and talking to your elected officials, you know, again, I feel like I keep using harsh language, but like confronting them when they're not doing the things that you want. And then if you're not getting what you want, you show up to the polls and you get rid of them if you don't like them. But we don't have all the tools and resources we need to be properly civically engaged because we don't have local media. And so it's, it's truly um, you know, a threat. And the last thing I'll add, you think about something like the Sinclair Group. These are what you think and look like local news stations, but they are owned by one entity. And there was a viral video some years ago where they played different anchors from all across the country. Again, these are supposed to be local um, news stations. And they were reading a script. They were all saying the same thing. Um, and so it also just demonstrates you know, how money can um, start to take these things over and we're not getting what we need. Yeah. I, ju I think that if all of that, if that worries you about your local community, one thing that you can do is find who is doing local work and support them. Subscribe to your local paper, support your local nonprofit website. I mean, that really is something that we all can do on the local level. Right. It's, it's a difference. It's a real difference maker, especially in smaller towns and smaller Absolutely, yeah geographic and areas. you know the local news issue does sound bleak but there is a lot of energy in the nonprofit space there's a lot of philanthropic support there are a lot of people who are trying to figure out how to make local news work and and particularly for marginalized communities so um, I do think that the energy around local news that is sort of a bright spot because there are a lot of really great um, journalists and news practitioners who are tackling tackling the problem um, so, you know, all the, all the um, I feel like there's an elephant in the room, right? Um, because I think getting folks to recognize when information is bad and getting them to sort of disregard, you know, bad information is not just about like shooting a bunch of facts at folks. Um, people don't believe misinformation just because they don't have access to the truth. There's social and political reasons why people um, want to believe things that um, are misleading. Um, and so how do you guys think about how you square that with the work that you do, right? Like there, there are just some people who are not going to be persuaded. Um, there are some people who are gonna be combative at the thought um, of wanting to be persuaded. So, persuaded. so talk to me about um, how you just sort of deal with that. In a way, it's, it's similar to covering community you haven't covered before. I think we all have to accept now that we are not given credibility. It, it doesn't, you have to earn it over and over. And I think in that scenario, you're right, you can't just tell people the facts. You have to have the facts. You have to try sh to share where you got them, why it's important, why the person that's telling you the disinformation share what their motivation is. I mean, it's like bring the receipts the best you can, and it doesn't always work. That's a formula that gets to work, you know, in one situation, but it's usually way more fluid. I, I don't think that's something we have an answer to, and we just have to keep 
working at, mm -hmm. but accepting that you can't fax somebody to death is just the reality. Yeah. And a part of the reality that you have to accept yeah. when you're doing this, yeah. Yeah, and all I'd add to that is, there's like a people psychological element to it. Um, you know, I don't know if it was because I was younger or times have gotten so crazy, but I was very just like, those people are stupid. I can't talk to them. They just won't get it. And now, I, it possibly also because I've been in a lot of like blue bubbles, but thinking back to growing up in North Carolina, people just have different experiences. And I think when, even when I was making assumptions that people just weren't smart, that was unfair. But people just literally have different lived experiences that bring them to where they are in their beliefs. So if that is someone's understanding of their lived experiences, you know, facts are not going to just be the thing that can um, dislodge whatever they believe. And I think it's important to like understand their perspective and where they're coming from, um, which is hard to do. I won't tell the whole story, but this class I took on race and democracy, the professor ended the class with, you just got to talk to people you don't agree with and hear them out and bring them along slowly. And I was like, why do we have to do that? Why can't they just read all the stuff I read and like understand it the way I understand it? And he was like, because that's not how it works. We're people and having those like long dialogues with people that you might not agree with or just are actually getting something wrong, you have to bring their guard down. If they don't trust you or they think that you're trying to call them stupid or you think you're smarter than them, they're not going to give you the benefit of the doubt um, in, in engaging. But if you can bring that wall down and try to have some shared understanding and mutual respect for each other, they're a lot more open and inclined to listening um, to what you have to say. And so I think before you can even start to deliver the facts, you have to create an environment that feels like a neutral ground where they're respected um, and you understand where they're coming from even if you don't agree with them. And you know, I'll always be prepared to leave the conversation still not agreeing. Right. Um, okay, I have one more question. Um, Aaron, this one's for you before we kick it to Q&A. Um, but you know, all of the tips that you and Shanique was shared do require um, critical thinking skills, right? And that is something we have to start teaching early. We can't expect people to turn 18 and just know all the information they need to know to like vote and just right. be civically engaged. Um, so how can uh, parents and educators uh, partner to ensure that we're teaching young people um, about media literacy and reinforcing those lessons often? I know this is something you're particularly passionate about. So it is sort of, I say all the time in the voting realm, you have to teach people to vote. We can't just expect them to vote. You have to teach them to vote. And the same is about reading the news and understanding the news environment. Um, my son is 10 now, and I've beat it into him enough that he doesn't answer this way anymore. But when he was about six and started reading, and I'd say, well, he'd tell me a fact, and I'd say, where, you lear where did you learn that? And he'd say, Safari, because that was the browser on his iPad. And so it's tedious. But with your kids, it really is important to go through and say, okay, you have new information that's so exciting. Where did you learn it? Let's together click and see who this person is. And most likely it's going to be a YouTuber or a TikToker. That's the way it is. A person who does TikTok. <laughs> um, the, so teaching them to learn where their information is coming from even if, if it's a basketball star, it, it doesn't matter. Just start going through the process of learning who is the provider of this information and where did they get it. And this is, I hope, my own, my only like not environmentally sound advice, but I think for kids, one of the most important things a parent can do is subscribe to a hard copy of a newspaper because they can't see you reading the news on your phone. But if you get a newspaper every day, especially because local news is suffering, there isn't as much content that kids might enjoy. But if you subscribe to a national paper, no matter what your kid is into, almost every day there's going to be something that interests them. My little guy loves the arts, but there's sports, there's fashion, there's science. If you just teach them that these news sources have valuable things that you can learn from and enjoy, it really helps build habits. Um, otherwise, all the other things of learning to read the news and all that. And then for educators, starting in the young grades, I think if you're a teacher, ask a local journalist to come and tell the kids how you build a story. For my son's class and other classes I've talked to before, 
I one time wrote a story about the business of balloons. And that sounds silly, but it turns out it's a giant business. It has so many female entrepreneurs. And I had to fact check how many company, new companies had balloons, how many balloons are sold. And so if you just show really how you build a story and do sourcing, they, kind of, they think it's fun and interesting, number one, but it helps them really start asking the who, what, when, where, why questions when they're reading. And I think you can teach kids by having them write a story. Like, ask them to find out how everybody gets to school. And then you calculate how many ride the bus, how many walk, how many ride their bike. Is everybody experiencing the same problem? And it just shows them you know, practical ways to how to do that. And then you just build when people get up. And with your teenagers, discuss your own media diet, discuss why you read what you do, why you like these sources because they believe the same things you do and kind of may help you learn how to vote and why you need these sources that just give you the facts. And it's really about, it is an ongoing everyday discussion, mm -hmm. but doing the little things, I think, work over time, just like taking your kids to vote with you as many times as you can teaches them to show up and not be intimidated and do their civic duty. Um, on that point, on print, there is a very popular uh, Gen Zer who um, has a TikTok account where she reads the front page of the New York Times, and so yeah, it's amazing. Maybe print is yeah. is the new wave. Um, okay, let's take our first question. Um, how can community-based initiatives and grassroots efforts contribute to promoting meter literacy and combating misinformation at the local level? That's. I think. I think you're the best answer on that? Um, yeah, I mean, I think it goes back to a lot of the things that um, have been said on this panel. Um, you know, I know that activists and folks who are really advocating for, um, you know, change do really rely on new reporting. They rely on media. They rely on facts coming out of the reporting that journalists across the country are doing every single day to, to, to shape the problem, to frame the problem, to frame their own messaging. Um, to help sort of push for change. And I think one thing um, that everyone can do is talk about that, right? Um, talk about the, the, the sources of your information. Talk about, um, you know, why you are, you know, sure that this information is, is valid and verified and continue at every step of the way to just be as transparent as possible about the information that we are sharing with one another. Yeah, and the one thing I'd add, and. I work in politics, so sorry for my political examples, but um, I think grassroots organizing and community-based organizations can actually serve a huge purpose in just getting information out to people. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, if you can yes. get to them first before they are scrolling or maybe right after they've scrolled on social media and tell them about the thing, um, that can go a long way. The example I wanted to use was student loan um, forgiveness. That is something that a lot of people think that Joe Biden hasn't done anything on. and you know, it didn't go the way he wanted it to go, but there are things that have been done, and I think if there were opportunities for people to come understand and learn how they could, for instance, apply for the SAVE plan and, you know, get all the benefits of that, that is a real-life example in your face that you have access to that combats anything that you're seeing online that's not real. Mm -hmm. um, next question. Uh, what barriers do individuals from disadvantaged backgrounds face in accessing reliable information in media sources, and how can these barriers be overcome? I think I'll, I can take that one too. I mean, I think the barriers are that, the overarching one being that, as Shaniqua said, in the past, journalism has been sort of an elite field, and so that didn't trickle down, and also because there was not enough reporting within disadvantaged communities. It was talking about them sometimes, but not reporting within. But I think today the main problem is, is that subscriptions are expensive. And unfortunately, news organizations have to make money or try to, and that means often charging for the news. So you can say go read the New York Times all day, but it's an expensive subscription. So I, I do think that cost is a disadvantage, but because there are so many sources of news and so many people sharing the information in the New York Times, I think it's about figuring out how to get those free sources um, to people. And we're not doing a great job of it, but it's, 
involves generating interest among younger people. It means spreading the information better. It probably means places like the New York Times reaching out to that woman and saying, thank you so much. How can we support you? Mm -hmm. I mean, I don't, I don't think there's an amazing answer to that. I think it's a lot of work, but I think, I do think cost is a barrier and mm -hmm. then just history of the makeup of readers are a barrier. And yeah, I would, sorry, I would say that, um, cost is a huge barrier, but also there are a lot of people in this country, particularly in rural America, who don't have access or don't have strong access to broadband internet, right? Um, yeah. In Gary, where we launched our second newsroom, um, in some zip codes, you know, more than half or close to half people don't have a stable connection. And I think that one of the, one of the um, ways to address this is really on us, right? I think that a lot of journalism is still sort of oriented around um, digital access, um, also around the written word, and there's also you know literacy challenges across the country. And so how do we think differently about accessibility? How do we think about not just being online, um, but also in radio, also one-to-one -one community events? Um, do we uh, you know employ SMS and text that does not require a connection? But I think really thinking creatively about how we being aware that not everyone has the same access as we do and then thinking creatively about how we reach folks is really important. Yeah. I was just gonna say support and invest and advocate for your libraries. That is a place that people can access, mm -hmm. um, you know, all of these things and get assistance um, with reading. It just, it's a good place for people to go. I know I relied on it heavily when I was growing up um, and it made the difference. Excellent point. Um, okay. My organization is launching a community-based journalism cohort comprised of college students. What are one or two tips you'd recommend as we train them? Um, I think one important tip for folks who are just getting started is, you know, people, to be a good journalist, you have to have a healthy sense of skepticism and you have to just sort of understand that you should just be sort of not you know, prime to believe everything you see and read on first sight, that there, a healthy level of skepticism is really important to just doing this work well, because when you are skeptical of something, you do more digging, you do more digging, you do more digging um, until things become really clear, and I think that's uh, an important thing to teach early on. Yeah, I mean, along that, the, <laughs> the basic things of always make sure you ask more than one person the question mm -hmm. and don't trust anyone's information. But I also think just on a broader, I think that's very exciting and wonderful, go forth. Um, listen to what your community needs to hear and provide them that information. And then also look where the holes are in your other news coverage and try to fill it. I mean, it, that's what makes news new news launches successful these days is if they're filling a void, um, and there are many to fill. So I think just being creative in what you cover, um, and cover the fun stuff too. People like to read about the fun stuff. So have a healthy balance of what um, you're providing, and it'll just broaden your audience, and um, the more readers, the better. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I think we have time for maybe one more question. Um, how do you listen to others' perspectives to understand without elevating that perspective as fact? How do you help high school students in this process? Um, Shaniqua, I think that you touched on this a little bit when you talked about honoring, you know, that people are coming from different backgrounds. I don't know if you have anything else to add. Yeah, um, again, just creating that foundation that people feel like you're listening to them, you're not patronizing them. But then after that, I mean, do please insert the facts, you know. Um, I, when I'm talking to people sometimes, I try to say, hey, well, I actually read something, let me show it to you, that said this. Um, I don't try, like, kind of the way this question is asking me, I don't try to present it as if I just am, I know everything and I have all these facts. I point to where I got it from, um, and especially if there's, like, you know, a cultural figure that everyone trusts, like, pointing to that person and saying, oh, well, you know, they actually pointed this out, and this is why I think that's true, and try to engage around a dialogue People will feel the way they feel, but I think if they trust the conversation, they will, they will talk to you. Thank you. Um, okay, we're out of time. Thank you so much, uh, Aaron and Shaniqua. This was great. Um, thank you all for coming. Thank, thank you. you.